So if that's cool with everyone, we'll, we'll make a little start here. So, John, Johnny, whatever you want to be called, J, J, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, the two of you, for coming on to the show. It's uh, really good to speak to the two of you, and it's good that you've made some time out of your day to come on and speak to myself. Uh, J, obviously, you've been on the show previously. <clears throat> But we're going to learn all brand new things about yourself that we didn't know. It's yeah. it's all going to be good. But before we get started, how are the two of you doing? I, I'm doing great, thank you. Yeah, it's a great afternoon yeah. here, and I'm just sitting in the studio here, hanging out with some mates. What more could you want? Yeah, doing great as well. Doing the same thing, sitting in the studio. <laughs> and I, I believe it's uh, Sunday after uh, Sunday evening. Correct. Correct. Yeah, as you can see, that it's unusual, but the sun is shining on, on a Sunday yeah. morning in Scotland. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> don't, don't you get like five hours of darkness? <laughs> yeah, and the rest of it's just rain. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> H- hence the reason Jane never wants to build a fish pond in Scotland. <laughs> you don't need it. They're already built in naturally. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. That yeah, is crazy. Yeah, what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to talk about all things music, music to yourself. We'll talk about the band, obviously. Um, yeah. But what I like to do, and I know Jay, you probably answered some of these questions previously, but we'll ask them again for anybody that, that didn't yeah. watch an episode. Um, I'll ask the questions to two of you. So, first of all, where did the two of you both grow up? We'll start with John. I was actually born in Melbourne and uh, I had a, a father who was in the banking system and so every two years he had to get moved to another town. So I've got this kind of you know patchwork of growing up in different regional places throughout Victoria as well as Melbourne and uh, we ended up settling down in a place called Bendigo in central Victoria for a number of years. That's probably the only real base I've had. I went back to Melbourne after that when I got loose of the, the shackles of the family. But yeah, so I've got a bit of a, a bit of a patchwork background of, of, of where I've lived and grown up in Victoria. But it's been mostly uh, yeah, Australia, Victoria. And Jay, bro. Well, I was uh, I lived at a few places. I was born in South Africa. Then we migrated to New Zealand in '96. In 2001, I decided to move to Melbourne to play music. And then from there on, I went to the US. I was there for 11 years, and now I'm back in Melbourne. And, yeah, it's been and a bit it, of a journey. Yeah. For the two of you, were you into music from a very young age? Were you influenced by like, your parents? Or, you know, how did you get into music? Was it from a very young age? Well, it was, it was for me, yeah. Uh, my parents had an old uh, bright piano, and I used to sit there when I was a little, little toddler and just bang away at it until I learned how to play Green's Legs of all songs. And I used to drive everyone in the family mad by doing that, you know, little, little PGO pattern from Green's Legs. But um, it's amazing how that can have an effect on your long term. You know, it's just something you bang away with, but actually it, it sort of planted a seed in me of music, and uh, there's a lot of music in the family anyway, but... Um, and shortly afterwards, I picked up the guitar and, and, and I went, I played, you know, I played a bit of drums for a while, did a bit of bass for a while, uh, some keyboards. I tried to get as much of everything in my headspace as I could as a young age because I think they all feed each other, off each other really, really nicely. So that's how it started for me. Yeah, for me, it was my dad, my mum. I come from a very musical family as well. My dad was a drummer. And he still plays from time to time nowadays, but not as frequent as what he used to. But I, I grew up just watching him, you know, and just being yeah. his roadie as a young age. And he, there was always music around. He always played music in the house. Um, mm. He was actually the drummer for my grandfather, and that's how he met my mum. He was the young young dude playing in my, my grandpa's band. So he was see, always around. See, with you being your, your dad's roadie, I'm assuming he paid you. No, no. <laughs> Just, I just got to hang out and see it. I wish, you know, I, I wish I could have, you know, just got into playing gigs a lot earlier. But, you know, it was that time when we moved to New Zealand. So um, didn't know many people. So my dad ended up getting a gig just for some extra money. Yeah. So it was just good for me to learn and watch. And I got to do that. So I'm quite grateful to see my oh, man play, you know. I've, I've actually had the chance to tell you, Jay, that my dad was a drummer as well, and I completely forget oh, wow. about that. Yeah, and yes. um, so there was something about that rhythmic component that was yeah. always in us, you know. And yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Absolutely, it's just yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Jay, I know that obviously the reason that you picked up the drums as an instrument was was pretty much because of your dad. Absolutely, but, absolutely. Uh, Donny, you're obviously you, you've tried various different instruments. So, what made you settle on the guitar? Portability. I, I think it's something about it. You know, you can grab that thing and go anywhere. And uh, I guess when you're getting lessons at high school, I used to get guitar lessons at high school. You know, you grab your, your, your know, on six string and take it into the class and do your thing and take it back. And I just, I love the fact that it was, you know, you could go out the road and, and park at the side of the road and then play the guitar. And which I did quite a lot back in those. Find a nice spot in the bush. You can't take the drum kit out to be hard to go and set up your your DW kit out the forest and have a go. Absolutely. So, <laughs> I know that now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I think the other thing too, as I might say, Ian, is that because I was writing music from a young age, I think um, I think having an, an instrument you can take with you and, and compose is really important. So I think the guitar is great for that. You know, it's just something that's there. You've got an idea, you grab it, off you go. I used to carry it around <laughs> in the back of my car and I used to have it, I shouldn't be telling you this, but I used to have a, a uh, guitar in the toilet and my mum used to hate me for it. Every time I go to the toilet, pick up the guitar and start playing songs, she's like, get that thing out of there. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't do good. <laughs> you obviously didn't, didn't realise that toilet, re- toilet reverb is the best. Oh, it is. It's the greatest. I've still got the guitar too. Uh, unfortunately, I should get rid of it. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if you realise this. Um, one of my favourite bands is The Doors. And when they recorded yeah. the last album, LA Woman, um, they recorded it in their, their rehearsal place. Because they were comfortable there, they just mic'd everything up. And they just yeah. hit record and they went for it. He recorded all his vocals in the toilet because it was natural reverb. Yeah. Pretty cool. It's great. We used to do it in Melbourne too. Where, where, when the whole band was living together in Camberwell, we used to uh, have our four tracks set up and it would be lines going to each bedroom and the singer would be in the bathroom. Yeah. And, and you know, we get this sound. I mean, obviously you can't pull that reverb sound off later on, but it's great for atmosphere, that's for sure. Yeah. So, so Johnny... You obviously, you picked up the guitar. Did you do start singing at the same time or was that something that came later on? Now, that, that's a big thing. I um, always playing guitar, always quite a proficient backing vocalist and um, I, if I don't mind saying so myself, but, you know, you just, it sort of comes with the territory if you're writing and stuff. But um, I... I um, terrified of being a frontman and, and uh, I had no aspirations to be a frontman, but... Um, Alpha Atomic was where all that happened for me because out of necessity, really, at that particular point. I'm not sure if you want to touch on that yet or not, but that's when I had to make that decision to move forward from, you know, being in a band as a guitarist and actually delivering songs and interpreting the songs that I've written, which make complete sense to me at the time, although I was shit scared. Yeah. <laughs> I've said this to quite a lot of people previously when I asked them how did they get into their instrument, and um, this singing is the one that is different from the rest because if you pl- pick up the guitar, the bass guitar, the drums, another instrument, you can go to lessons, you, you can learn a lot of things from just other people that you're jamming with. Mm-hmm. Vocals is, is the one instrument that, yes, you can learn certain things, but, but there is a huge part of it is confidence and you can't teach someone confidence. You know, I, and, I, agree. I agree, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's really cool. Um, for a lot of people and a lot of time it is out of necessity who is the bravest person to stand in front of the microphone or we don't want to be an instrumental band we need to have a singer so I'm I'm guessing it's going to be me and a lot of it kind of comes through that way but you do have to have an ability you need to be able to sing you need to be able to listen but there's a huge part of its confidence which is the tricky part because you, you can't teach that and I agree, and that's a very big hurdle to get over, particularly when you don't have an aspiration to be a singer. A lot of people, you know, are born, I'm going to be a singer. Oh, no, I'm going to be a guitarist, you know. And, and so making that decision is, is really difficult. And I, I remember doing a show a couple of years in at the Gershwin Room, which is one of the old Victorian venues uh, in the Esplanade Hotel. I don't know if you know it, down in St Kilda. And there might have been 250 people there, and I walked out with Alpha Atomic and I put on my guitar and I thought, what the fuck am I doing here? Oh, seriously, it's... Sorry, for swearing, but yeah, constantly having those moments for the first couple of years of thinking, what have I done, you know, because, but, but you know, uh, you maybe you just you kind of grow into it or something. It, it took a few years, but initially, oh, 
you know, it was really, really difficult. But I knew I was doing the right thing because I think that as the writer of the songs, I, I think I had to deliver what they were about. And it's hard to yep. work with other people all the time. And I've done that for years, tr- grappling with singers who, you know, oh, I don't get it and I don't want to do this and I'll do it that way. And, and I think ultimately um, I, I had to do it. So The problem that you've got as well is that whenever you look at another band, <clears throat> the, the, the front man, the singer, they make it look easy because they're obviously good at doing it. And it's, it's yep. like it. if, if you're good at, at doing something, you make it look easy until you step up to the microphone to do it yourself. Now, if you're a, a drummer, you know, you're, you're probably looking at your kit. If you're a guitarist, you can look at the guitar. You've got the pedals on the floor. If you're a singer, you're eye to eye with, with the audience. And it, 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 it is tricky. But as you say, sometimes you know what you want it to sound like and sometimes it's best for you just to do it yourself rather than trying to explain it to someone else. You're correct. And that, that eye contact thing, that's a completely different craft. You know, I'm, I'm certainly no Steve Tyler. I mean, you know, I would love to have been that kind of flashy, flurry person. But there's something about the 90s I found, particularly in Melbourne, when every band was migrating to Melbourne, there's this real, you know, hotbed of uh, developing music. It, it sort of gave us... Uh, you know, uh, leeway to try these things, and I felt confident enough to do it because I saw other bands doing similar stuff. And amazing when somebody settles into the role of the frontman, when they become comfortable fronting the band, singing, talking to the audience, it, it's actually quite amazing. I can remember um, watching an interview, and it was James Hetfield from Metallica mm-hmm. saying that he can be out on stage in front of sixty thousand people and be completely calm. You take him off stage, that's when he's a nervous wreck and he's uncomfortable in social situations, but on stage in front of 60,000 people, no problems. It's weird. And it's almost like a persona. It's almost like a perform. It's an act. I mean, that's not the right way to put it, but if you know what I mean, you go out, you're doing a gig, you've got your guitar, you've got everything cranked up and you become that person. And then when you step off, you're hiding in the shadows again. And I think you develop that over time and over time you get quite good at doing it. And, and I found uh, after Alpha Time, I was in a number of bands that I was a front man in and I got quite good at doing that towards, you know, I was quite cocky and I was even surprising myself. I think, fuck, I don't know how I can do this. I don't know. You, but, but I think it is. It's something, like you said, you, you kind of, you know, you get into a zone and it's not really who you are off stage. It's kind of like the Hatfield thing where you get on stage and I am the singer of this band now and I have to deliver this, you know? Yeah. So, Johnny, you, you're um, drawn towards the guitar, um, eventually singing as well. Jay, mm. you're on the So... What were some of the first bands that you were discovering when you when you sort of developed your own musical taste? You can go first. Oh, come on. It's all yours. <laughs> the first band, okay, the first band that I discovered, you know, look, my dad introduced me to a lot of music growing up, like Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Phil Collins, like Genesis and Police yep. and that sort of bands, Journey. And then once I kind of moved to New Zealand and I kind of became, when I was, became a teenager, like I got to jam with a lot of different musicians and I got introduced to bands like Rage Against Machine, um, Korn, all the heavier stuff, Pantera. But then we also, then there was Stone Temple Pilots. It was a whole broad, you know, mixture of styles. But I, I kind of just tried to broaden my, my, collaborate my collab uh, vocabulary sorry um, being a drummer you know like studying with jazz guys and stuff it was to me it wasn't just about just listening to just rock music or just metal it i just kind of went to what's good and what sounds good yeah and um mm. and i think mm. that just makes you a better all-around musician you know to yeah. not just kind of judge oh it's not metal enough you've got to kind of listen mm. to the melodies you've got to listen to the the lyrics, all that sort of stuff. And sometimes simplicity is the key. And it's not yeah. about how much technique you have and technicality. You know, yep. simple is mm. sometimes better. What about so. yourself, buddy? Uh, is that me? Sorry, I just got cut yeah. off. Yeah. Um, well, I grew up with my parents playing music all the time, and I don't want to make this sound like Spinal Tap, but uh, classic and jazz was, was on the spin all the time. Of course, there was Top 40 stuff, but um, a lot of Elvis, Willie Nelson, all kinds of stuff going on. And, you know, that kind of filters in, but I've got older sisters, and so 
I was lucky that they were doing the Sabbath thing and everything in that period as well. So I was getting all that heavier stuff coming through, plus mum and, mom and dad's uh, jazzy classic. And, and I, it must have had a profound effect on me because I know that I, I analyse it nowadays when I'm writing music. I'm always looking for modulations that are slightly odd and it must come from that jazz thing when they, uh, you know, they move through different pitches and keys and they modulate to different keys and stuff. And it's not very common in, in I think, you know, rock music in some ways. And I'm always trying to hear that. And I keep on thinking, maybe it was that. And it was maybe it was mum and dad playing jazz music all the time. And it's quite beautiful. And I find myself listening to jazz quite a bit nowadays as well, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. The, and like Jay, we've got this big kind of, you know, mashup plus the heavier stuff as well, and I was an Akadaka yeah. fan. When, once I discovered, yep. uh, once I discovered TNT, you know, ACDC, God, you know, but I, they just they blew me away. I'll need to remember that next time I'm writing a song, it's not a mistake; it's a modulation. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> They're the best ones ever. <laughs> I actually saw I saw ACDC just really quickly. Uh, uh, this is a profound moment for me. I saw on their Back in Black tour after Bond died, I saw them in Melbourne. I was just a little kid, uh, and I, I, I just couldn't believe it. I was starry-eyed. They'd come back. You know, they're all in black. Everyone in the audience was black. It was at the Maya Music Bowl. And it, it, sh- it shook me to the core. You know, it was one of those you know, pivotal moments in your life, and I thought, Wow. That's rock and roll, you know, and that, it does affect you forever. You know what? They, they're a band that I, I've only ever seen them once. Now, I, for years I had, it was a DVD, and it was um, it was them headlining Donington. And I think it was 1990 or 91, like early 90s. Yeah. And to me, that was them at, at their, their peak. That You know, that was them just absolute perfection. And I got to see them on the Black Eyed tour, which was, you know, I think that was 2018. So 18, you know, sorry, uh, 28 years later. And they absolutely, they were just, they killed it. They were absolutely amazing. Even all those years later, they, they proved me wrong. They, they, they were yeah. outstanding. And they played at Hamden, which is the, the big football stadium. I mean, I know they're still they're still going just now, and uh, they, they still seem to be going great. I know there's unfortunately a few members have uh, are no longer there, but I, I still got to see them when it was the original band. Yeah, but yeah. I know Mal- Malcolm Young on rhythm guitar. Uh, to me, he was always God in a lot of ways because all those riffs he concocted were just that signature of ACDC. They're a bit kind of like what Jay was saying. No, they they're the perfect example that you don't need to be technically amazing you know less is more the yeah. stuff that they do and but they, th- they make it look so easy they, mm. they don't how difficult it is and there's a, there's a lot of drummers i know who you know rock metal drummers, and and they'll say that you know they'll, they'll always talk about dave lombardo mm. igor cavalera all these guys that are technically gifted but those guys will say to you go back and listen to to phil rudd and just get the basic, if you yeah. can get basic beat, which is not easy to do, but if you mm. can do that, you can then progress on and do whatever it is you want, but you need to, to get that part of it done first. Absolutely. He had True. a feel as well, the way he played the hi-hats too. He had that swing yeah. you know, as well. And, and he's, do, he's doing the, uh, what is it, the um, uh, Let There Be Light, uh, what is Let There Be Rock, and he's doing that for six minutes. You know, he's just going oh. flat out. And, and yeah. I'm, you watch it and think, what's it, you know. And, and it's very it's simple, like, like you over. said. But, yeah, it's a certain technique or, you know, style yeah. that manage that. It's the yeah. same with um, Steve Adler from Guns N' Roses. Yes. yes. I think he initially had the big kit and they were like, no, 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 you need to cut that right down to a very basic kit. And um, they've got people that have drummed after them, but nobody's got that that swing, that feel of, of yeah. hip from that first album. But maybe I'm going to embarrass yourselves now, but obviously, <laughs> Jay Bro, you're on drums, John, you're guitar. What was the first, you, you talked about that, the, the, you've talked about the bands that you were discovering when you were teenagers. What was the first ever album that you bought with your own money? I shouldn't. I shouldn't talk because I'll give up my age. But <laughs> it was. Uh, it was for me. It was Skyhooks living in the seventies. Um, I don't know if you know that album or that band, Ian. But but they were massive in Australia, and um, 
my sisters hated me because I played it and played it and played it to death. Yeah. <laughs> and they'd get that off, put Sabbath back on, you know. But uh, for me, uh, really technically gifted guys and a bit of humour in the music and very poppy and uh, I-, I loved it. Your turn, Jay. Mine was Nirvana, Nevermind, and the Metallica, the Black Album. Those are the ones that I bought, yeah. Yep. I mean, that that's pretty, pretty good choices, but uh, do you also remember what was the first ever professional concert that you got to attend? Well, that's a good question. <clears throat> wow. I, I can't remember. That's really weird, isn't it? I've seen so many over the years. How about you, Jay? You, you'll, you'll have something I can just oh. see you. <laughs> so I, saw, I saw Faith No More in 98. Right. Just before they broke up, their last tour before they broke up. Now they're back together now, but that's when I saw them in NZ and blew my mind. It was just so good. Yeah, it was an unbelievable band. It might have been the Angels for me. I think. I think it was the Angels. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> many years ago. The thing that doesn't leave you that the the life feel. I can remember going to my first ever concert, and I can remember going in to the to the arena. And it, I think the roadies were probably still, it was 20,000 people, you know, it was, a, it was a big, big place. And the roadies were still doing the sound checks, setting up the, the, the drums and getting the levels correct. And see even just hitting the, the kick drum to get the levels and you feel it in your chest. Oh, I love yeah. that. I love yeah. that. From the subs. It doesn't matter how, how good your headphones are or your stereo system at, at home, you don't get that feeling from listening at home to when you're standing in the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you feel that air, the feeling the air move from the subs is just yeah, powerful, yeah. isn't it? It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So it's a good going, feeling. We're going to fast forward. So Al Potomac originally started around 1996. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. And it was yourself, guitar and vocals, Denny on bass, Stephen on drums. Uh, Steve Boyle was in a whole scene with me um, prior to the band starting. He came in for about a year, but he wanted to be set up a coffee shop. So, okay, cool. So he went off and set up a coffee shop. And that's when we found Andy Strack. And I, we went and ad in the, uh, in the street press and Andy came to an audition and he just landed the gig perfectly. You know, we had to get rid of his frame, his drum frame. So we don't really need a drum frame for this kind of stuff. We just want, like you were saying before, we just want a rack and a floor. We want to keep it kind of earthy and rocky, and which he did, and he fitted in perfectly. So for the, for the duration of the band, it was, it was the three of us, yeah. So. so where did the band name come from? Uh, that's a good question. It's got something to do with alcohol and atomic somewhere in there. And I can't remember, actually. I've been asked that before, but uh, Andy might have something to do with that. But, um, yeah, you, we got away with it. Can you not remember because of the alcohol? Probably. <laughs> is uh, That would have been the right answer, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, back in, in those early years, the band had success. I know that he's had a, a single living in luxury. Yeah. So used for a couple of different like TV shows. You've had an EP, Where You Go, which was quite successful, had a lot of um, radio. Mm. What was it like in those early years? Oh, it was amazing. We, um, like, you know, obviously, as I said before, I was trialling out this kind of new experience as a front man, and um, I was validated in some ways because we were – uh, getting tours and we we're doing television appearances. We we're signed to an Australian label. We had a, an independent label in the US we'd signed to and we we're invited to festivals and all kinds of stuff. And it was, it was really good. A lot of time, obviously, it's a note to cliche, but a lot of time in the van traveling around the country. But when you three of you, it's, it's great fun. There's not six people arguing and massive egos. There's three blokes who get along really well. And it was really, I love that portability of a three-piece, and that was one of the attractions for me. It was that, you know, the energy you could get out of a three-piece band, uh, and we were super uh, compact and, and mobile, you know. So we could get around and we could play and we could tour and do all that kind of stuff, and they were good years. So it was easy and fun. I mean, that's kind of similar to what, what Jay had said on the previous episode with, with his previous band, Duke Cartel. You know, musically... They were great, but one of the great things about the band was that the four or five of you in the band, you just got on good. You know, there was no sort of uh, egos. It, it was like just hanging with your mates, having a great time, creating great music, playing good gigs, uh, you know. And uh, it sounds like it was the same for Alcatomic, but uh, 
Why did the band then split up in 2001? Because you seem to be doing really well and, and going from strength to strength. It's a good question. I've thought about it a lot over the years. It was, it was not a definite line in the sand. We got to a point where, you know, you're looking for more support. We didn't have much money because more blotters were on the doll at the time. We are working in cafes and we needed to move forward with some, some financial support, which was very difficult to get. And, um, you know, I think if you're not growing in a band, you're sort of dying in some ways. I think you've got to keep rolling forward. And we sort of hit the wall in some ways. And I, I had a bit of a mini crisis in, in 2001 and thought, oh, I've got to do something. I, I had nothing to fall back on. I've been playing music for all these years. And I uh, went back to uni to study graphic design. And, and that little break in the band momentum, uh, I think, really triggered the end. And Andy uh, was able to uh, – he uh, landed a gig with The Living End – uh, he, he was about to pack up and go back to Adelaide and uh, he thought, I'll just go over this audition with The Living End. I don't know if you know The Living End or not, Ian. And um, he got the gig and, and that was it. It was bye-bye to Andy and I was doing a bit of study and that was really the end of it. So there wasn't like you know a major blow-up or issues. It was just a little kind of fragmentation towards the end. And we had a great run and it can't be uh, not happy about what happened. It was a great experience. And so we just sort of jagged off a little bit at the end. It does sound, Jay, a bit similar to Duke Cartel that you were going yeah. strength yeah. to strength and then Absolutely. there got to a point where it, it just sort of, I, don't, I wouldn't yeah. say you all, but you were just not getting to the next level. And That's it. As Tommy had said to us, you know, you guys were playing these great gigs, but you were struggling financially mm-hmm. and you get to a point yes. maybe at a certain age as well that you're like, mm-hmm. is this going to happen? And if it's not, what am I going to do with my life? Um, exactly. Were, Jay, were you aware of the band back then? Alcatomic? Yeah. Oh, no, because I was living in the US. I lost, once Duke Cartel kind of left, I lost a lot of touch with the Australian industry and the music industry. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it was just, we, once we moved, it was just all over there. And I was getting introduced to a lot of new music over there, you know, but it's always good to be back here. It's so, a lot of good music mm, in Australia. Yeah. If we fast forward, how did how did it come about for Alcatomic getting back together? And, Jay, how were you then introduced to them? Well, for me, it was COVID again. It was got a COVID story. But for me, I pulled out a box at the back of the studio full of hundreds of cassettes. Uh, you know, we used to have cassettes, remember the 90 minute cassettes? And um, I would just think, I'm going to go through these and see what's on there. And there's all these songs I've been uh, demoing since the early 90s. And come the 98 to 99 cassettes, I put them in. I thought, holy shit, you know, these were the songs that we were demoing in Alcatomic for a, a possible album that would have been the early 2000s. And the songs blew me away. I, I listened to them, I thought, your shit, you know, all these songs sound fantastic, Bridges and Sunshine and everything. And I, I thought, fair enough, went to bed and I couldn't stop thinking about it. I thought, well, w- what happens here now? I mean, uh, these songs were written by me at that period for that band and they're, they're, they're strongly 90s orientated with their melodies and, and their structures and, and everything. What happens now? Do I go and set up a new band and start from scratch or do we actually honour that period and say these songs from that period, do we reignite the band in some way? And, and and that sort of seemed to make sense to me and that's what happened. It was just a matter of talking to Paul and the rest of them and say, well, should we maybe try, you know, uh, finishing off these songs that we intend for an album and let's see what happens. And I had to, right from the start, I thought, I'm going to go step by step. There's no grandiose plan of... Oh, here we are. Not there's much to come back to anyway, but it was more about let's just uh, do some production on the songs and see what happens. Okay, sounds okay. Well, maybe we should go and record them. And that's when Jay came in because I knew that Andy at this point was off touring with The Living End and I didn't even bother asking Andy because he'd been sort of uh, disconnected from all of us, just from that kind of major deal sort of thing, yeah. you know, and in the US a lot of the time. And So a mutual friend of ours, Dave Say, who used to be my booking agent, um, he said, I know somebody who might be good for your band. <laughs> he just came back from the US and he's a rock drummer. And I said, we need a rock drummer. I put a phone call into Jay and I said, Jay, we're doing these songs for Alcatomic. We need a, a good drummer. And we connected straight away. He came over here and uh, played on these songs and just nailed it. There was, it was nothing, oh, it's nothing for me to say. I just I thought, what a perfect fit for the band, you know. So that's how that kind of came about. 
That's it. We just had chemistry with the music too. Yeah. It just gelled, you know. And even gelled, though our, right? our band was slightly different, we still came from that rock space, you know, and, and uh, yeah, exactly. it just happened. Yeah. Yeah. Naturally, which is yeah. great. So I've obviously, I've had um, the new single Bridges, I've had it blasting out the, the car when I'm driving <laughs> around central Scotland. So uh, people should be aware of it. Um, Good. Awesome. I've, I've, got it on, I've got it on the phone. I love to always like listen to people's music and, and think, you know, who does it remind me of? Like, there's always influences when you, when you hear other people's music. To me, it sounds like Alice Cooper and Pink Floyd, but with a modern day rock twist. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> even in your mindset, but that's what it sounds like to me. It's funny you should say that because I usually get the Clash, and and, and, and nothing to do with the Clash, but it's um. It's one of those songs that I don't know where it came from, and I, I don't know if you're a songwriter in or not, but you know how sometimes you'll sit down and uh, uh, the riff came up and then the lyrics literally fell onto the page. You know how sometimes a, a rhythm and a, and a melody can actually make stuff come out of your brain? <laughs> and, yeah. and that's how it all unfolded quite um, quickly, but um, yeah, undeliberately. And, and I don't know don't know what it was all about, it was influenced by it. And I do like Alice, early Alice Cooper. Um, definitely not conscious of that at the time, but... It's, got, it's a great thing, I think, when a song comes out, like it's born of itself without, you know, being a conscious of other sounds, and that's what it was, and, and yeah. I'm very happy with it. It, it yeah. doesn't sound like it, but I get um, schools out for summer vibes. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with a bit more of an angry attitude. <laughs> the cool thing about it, so you, you listen to the song, First chorus, it's, it's, it's going along, it's sounding good. Gets to sort of the solo bridge section, and as and out comes a saxophone. <laughs> it, you could have had second guitarist doing a guitar solo, and it would have sounded, you know, just as good. But it, it wouldn't have made it stand out. That it's the saxophone that that separates it from the other millions of bands where it's a guitar solo that comes in and that that's the cool thing about it. It just gives it a completely different vibe, which is, is really cool. Uh, can I keep that? Can you can you go down writing for me? I'll put it on the website because I, I've, cut, I've cut so much shit from my peers and my old indie rock friends are like, what if you put a saxophone in some for though? Come on, no, no. sax was rock and roll in the days. People used to use sax all the time in bands. It's like, what is wrong with that? And I, and like you, I thought, yeah, I could go into a solo, but man, you know, the sax brings a, I don't know, a different energy but, to the song. But, but but when you're actually talking about, it, you could have played the same thing on the guitar, like the same Easy. notes, and it would have sounded good, but it wouldn't have made it stand compared to yep. the saxophone. Something sexy about the sax. Well, I mean, look at that guy from the Lost Boy, the beach. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Uh, but you know, I always said that the sax and the, and the guitar—they're not. You, you think they're not a lot different in a lot of ways. They sound quite the same. Ones you're just blowing into when you're playing with your things, but they could interchange really easily. And and I thought if we have to go and do some shows here, we're not going to have the saxophone play with us. We're going to have to probably you know do a, a guitar interpretation of it. But it'd be quite easy to do. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, I don't know if you've heard of them, there's a Scottish rock band called Biffy Clyro. Yes. Have you, have you heard of them? Heard. Yeah, I have. And they do that as well, though. They'll, they'll get to, like, the bridge section, and I can't remember the name of the song, but there's one particular song where instead of it being the guitar that does, like, the melody, they've got, you know, remember at, at school you'd have a wee glockenspiel? Yeah. So it's, it's a, it just comes out of nowhere. You've got this big, heavy rock band and then in this bridge section, I'd lock and spiel doing the melody rather than the guitar solo. It, it, it's crazy, but... That, but it that's works. beautiful. Yeah, 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 it works. It's beautiful, mm -hmm. unpredictable. And, and it can, like you said, you kind of think, whoa, you have a little step back and you think, that works really well. And nothing wrong with that. Exactly. So you, you've obviously you got all these old demos. Is, is that kind of what you guys are working on at the moment? Is revamping those songs or are you actually writing new songs? Well, it's funny, it's like being in a cover band because we are, we're doing, really these songs were from that period and they had to be finished. So some lyrics weren't finished off and some of the structures weren't completed. So we're adding, you know, some, you know, uh, in the moment uh, additions to the songs, but they were all largely written in that period. So, yeah, that, that's a good question because moving forward, 
if, if we're establishing um, that sort of sound that has those nuances of the 90s, uh, would you start writing fresh material or not? Because as Jay knows, I've, I've found another tape stack full of great songs. I think we just keep doing covers of our own songs, you know. It's yeah. a bit like that in some ways. And, and I've got to say, finding the cassette, um, it was like listening to somebody else. It had been so long since I'd heard that tape. And putting like it refresh. in, it, it didn't sound like me. And I thought, who's this? You know, and it's me, you know, singing this song. So it allowed me to be really objective as well because there'd been so much space between. I could say, that shit, <laughs> you know, that one sounds really good. And because, you know, as you would know, and you can't do it when you're too close to songs. You've got to have that space from them. And it was fantastic. So, yeah, what do we no. do now? I don't know. Good question. I would have thought your biggest obstacle nowadays would have been finding a tape player to actually play the <laughs> It's, it's where is it? It's just here somewhere. <laughs> you know what? I, I I inherited this tape player from my grandmother when she passed away. I mean, she obviously didn't have much, but I got the tape player, and it's been my companion for about twenty five years. It's like, you know one of those little national ones with a handle on it, and you just you know they've got the tape goes on the top, and I'm still using it. And so I, yeah, I had to use that to go through them. <laughs> the reason I'm, the reason I'm laughing about that. But a friend who he just spent the last year recording his uh, an album, his own his own album, and he, he spent a lot of time and effort into this album. It sounds sounds really great, and he then he got the you know spent a lot of time getting the artwork together, his track order, and, you know it was all packaged together really really nice, and uh, he sent you know he got the masters, he sent them away to to get he wanted to get some CDs made along with putting it. Uh, as streaming and downloading, he got the CD through, and he he, he goes over to to my other friend's house, the one that actually mixed it for him. He said, "Look, I've I've got my CD, artwork looks great," and he's like, "How does it sound?" I don't know. I've not got a CD player. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that true? Yeah, it's even. It used to be that all the car your car would automatically come with a CD player, but even nowadays. Yeah, no, no, no. The SB port that you've got. So they had to go and try and find a CD player to actually put the CD in because it, it just doesn't happen um, nowadays. Yeah, and I hear people talking about there's a bit of resurgence, not just vinyl, of course, but people are sort of revisiting cassettes as well, which is kind of interesting. I spent a bit of money, and I shouldn't be talking about this. So this is not at the Tascam, but they make this unit where you put a tape in and a, and a memory stick, and it'll take the, the, the tape recording straight onto the memory stick as an MP3. And that's fantastic. So that's been getting a serious workout. Yeah. That's awesome. Is that an old uh, task arm four track? No, no. It's just a standard, uh, like a rack mount uh, cassette player with a oh. USB component. It's got a CD player as well. So you can put in tapes or CDs and it'll, it'll put them straight on a memory stick, right. which is so, bloody awesome. So you've got all these, these songs that you're working on. Uh, you're in the studio. So how, how do you go about recording in the studio so Jay what what is the, the stand is there a standard setup um for alcoholic recording in the studio does it does it start with yourself laying down the drum foundation yeah um I'll come in Johnny will send me some songs I'll work on it at home and just come up with some ideas you know just kind of feel the song start gelling with it a little more listen to the melodies and what's going on then I'll start putting just a basic groove down and I'll build a little bit and then I'll give it to Johnny, and then we'll go back and forth. And then when it's time, I'll go into the studio and lay down the drums. And I'll just bring a whole bunch of gear and just mix up what, what's in good. The studio, in the studio, do you play to a click track, or, or is it just a natural feel? Oh, no. I use click. I use click okay. track, yes. Mm. Absolutely. The last stuff we did, uh, Johnny got me to record without cymbals, which was very different and interesting. But it actually sounds all right. It worked. What, what was the reason for that? Is that to stop it feeding through into the other mics? That's correct. Because like cymbals, you know, you get a lot of sp spill, bleed. That's normally the issue that you're going to get when you go into a studio. The first issue that you'll get is cymbals bleeding and interfering with the other mics. So doing this, you know, I think Dave Grohl did that in Queens of the Stone Age, Songs for the Deaf. He did that as well. Mm. And it was a little challenging, but I think what really helped is using a metronome to stay in time. And that definitely helped, and to give me the guide where I'm supposed to play the hits, you know what I mean? So are you not even using the hi-hat at that point, or is the hi-hat the only No. Hi-hat and right think 
are the only ones. The splash, mm. splashes and chine, uh, splashes and crashes are the ones that I overdubbed. But all this other symbols are overdubs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he sits back and hits them. <laughs> and, and it's great when we get the mix because you've got that option of, you know, riding them all without bringing all the other drums up underneath it. So mm. yeah, I think it worked well. Yeah. But it's it's a bit That's tricky though, Joe. I remember Joe sitting there going, <clears throat> you know, just oh, missing the symbol yeah. by this much, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's really tricky. Really but, tricky. But what what is the setup then? So you've got all your drums mic'd up, you've got the headphones on. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And Johnny, are you playing like a, a sort of a guitar guide track? Yeah, no, I'll actually, re- I'll just track that. I'll just put down a, 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 a you know, a what guide. do we call it? A scratch vocal, whatever. Um, yeah, I'll put down a vocal guide. and a, a guitar, a guy track for him and he'll just go and do his mm-hmm. thing. Mm. Right. Yeah. And uh, so are you working on an album at the moment or an EP or are you not quite sure? Are you just recording and working on songs? Well, we've got, we've got an album worth of songs. So oh. this is the bit, and this is the thing, it, it, we could have dropped an album, but it's that question about the kind of current world we live in. It's like, well, Mm. do we just drop singles for a while and see how that goes? And then maybe once we get four or five out, we'll do an album next year and just put them all together on an album. So I I think it's really hard when you're coming from ground base, you know, like because in the 90s we had following and and, and pre-technology, but, you know, starting again now, we're right down at the bottom again. And and I think that, I think, I think sort of uh, launching out with an album is not, probably sensible it's better to just to kind of chip away with some singles and see if we can generate some more interest and start to build again and then if, if there's if it does happen we'll, we'll drop an album next year it's weird that i've spoke again with a few people about this whether or not nowadays is there an appetite for an album or because because Great. the way that because access nowadays a lot of it's just singles and you'll know yourself back in the day you would go and buy an album and if you or if you were creating an album, you had the so- if you had ten songs, you wouldn't just put the ten songs on the album. You, you know there had to be an order. You know, song one, I had to start with this song, I had to lead into that song, I had to definitely end on this song. I mean, there, there was a reason for the track listing in the order that it came in because mm-hmm. you're, you're listening to the album as a whole package. And the artwork was just as important because, you, you know, you would look at the CD booklet or whatever it was you were looking at. And a lot of that is missed nowadays. And I do ask people, is it still important? But it depends who you ask. It also depends what age they are. You know, I'm, I, I'm 42. So I grew up in a time where you didn't have the internet, you didn't have access to unlimited music. So if you had 15 albums at home, you knew those albums inside out because that's what you listen to, you know, and you would maybe swap with a friend or that. And uh, personally, I think it's a shame because I, I really li- I love the whole package of it. But there's some people it's just it's not they're just not interested. It's they're quite happy with with singles. There seems to be a middle ground though, which is a lot of people seem to be quite happy settling on EPs at the moment. So. So instead of doing a 10-song album, you'll maybe do a four-song EP and you're focusing on four songs, which is a lot easier to focus on. But also, if you've got 10 songs in an album, generally there will be two or three of them end up being fillers, almost mm-hmm. whereas with four mm-hmm. songs you're focusing on, it's four singles, it's four great songs that you're focusing on. So there is different options out there, but as is things like the artwork and all that still important to yourself to, to help advertise the band? Uh, I think it is, but you're right. It, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the masterpiece of the album, isn't it, where you get that really work hard on the album artwork and the liner notes and everything. It, it's, you know, it's, it's your big deal. It's your crowning moment. But when you're doing singles, I think it's the artwork's, you know, uh, just something is going to cover this and, and we'll move on to the next one. But I'm a bit like you, Wayne. I do miss that because the, uh, listening to an album was an experience. It was an adventure, wasn't it? From, from the start to the end. And we, you know, we all did it. We all looked, looked at the notes, read about it. You know, we get in the headspace and it's a shame it's not around. But a friend of mine who manages one of uh, the big bands in Australia said to me the other day, he said that an album is worth one song nowadays and he said so why would you do an album unless he said unless you've got a great following and things are really happening you can move albums and get people into it so i mean that's just his opinion but um he might be right he might be right that we just need to kind of get some runs on the board then we do the album so i don't know but you lose that continuity the the other cool thing though is if you're if you're releasing 
let's say you work on five songs and you think I'm going to release these five songs over the next 12 months it keeps people interested that every couple of months there's something new coming out uh, yep. but it, it's not too big a project that you can work on you can focus on those five songs get them sounding excellent before, and you know you're keeping people interested you're giving them something every couple of months rather than having to wait a year for one album Exactly, and I think you, you, to, in order to do that, you've got to batch these things up first, you know. And I think that's what we have done. We've got those all those songs squared off, so we can just start picking how we're going to drop them out. But you're right; I think people just um, burn out quickly. You know, even after two weeks, uh, what's it been about a week and a few days since Bridges came out? People are probably already thinking, "What's next?" You know, I'm over that one. Let's move on. Mm-hmm. Through no fault of their own, I think it's just the way it is nowadays. We just consume and, and get rid of it. Yeah, there, there's no. I think the world that we live in, there, there's no attention span now, yeah, especially mm-hmm. more so for younger people, mm-hmm. uh, because they're so used to just getting everything instantly. They don't have to wait mm-hmm. for it. But I, even myself, you know, I'm guilty of it as well. That you know, you don't, you know, the la- the, the last Metallica album that came out. I'm a, I'm a big Metallica fan. If there was, two, <coughs> there's maybe three or four that I remember. And the rest are forgettable. Now that might be the songs, but that might also just be me. The, the way that that I am nowadays is that you're, you're certainly not paying attention to it as much. But then at the same, t- back in the day, and you would have maybe been the same. You're going off to high school. You'd have your your cassette Walkman tape player, mm-hmm. your headphones. Yep. You'd walk yeah. to school and you'd walk back again listening to this album. You don't do that nowadays. That's just a thing of the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is absolutely. It's sad, but um, yeah, we've lost that whole concept, hasn't we, of the album in a lot of ways. And like you said, I think we're all a bit guilty. We all get a little bit conditioned, don't we? Even though I never thought I would, I think, like you, we sort of skip through a little bit. And what's next? I want something, <clears throat> you know. But on on the flip side to that, the really really cool thing about nowadays is we're on here talking just now. Now, if this was the nineties. I wouldn't know that you guys existed and you would not know that I existed. There would be, there'd be no, no way that your music would reach Scotland. Not, not a chance. No, no. it would be a lot different then, yeah. So that's, right. the, that's the beauty of, of technology today is that it can also be really good. You know, it's so easy to connect with people regardless of where you are in the world. You guys are representing Australia. I'm over here in Scotland. I want to know how much you guys know about Scotland. Well, I'll tell you that my about my ancestry is from Scotland, from Inverness. Right. So you know, I do feel it in my blood, brother. I can feel it. So I don't know about Jay, but uh, yeah, I think my great grandparents are from Scotland. So you know, there you go. That's my claim fame. But also, you know, my one of my most influential bands, ACDC. They're all Scottish boys anyway. So, yeah, exactly. so Jay, Jay, I'm uh, a bit worried here, but honestly, you don't need to be worried. <laughs> no, I would. <laughs> The closest thing I came to Scottish, you know, like the tradition, I was in a Scottish pipe band in high school. Oh, they really? Skirt boy. So I was playing the <laughs> snare drums, you know, and that's so, how I got into my rudiments and stuff. So you're in, in the Scottish pipe band, Johnny, you've got um, great grandparents from Scotland. None of that's going to help you, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> look, you look, you look, we have bagpipes a long way to the top, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm going to ask you some Scottish words, and I want you guys to tell me what you think they mean. Okay. Right. Out. Right. So, if I was to speak to to the two of you, uh, if I was to heaver to you, to you, what am I doing? T- say it again. If I, was to, if I was to haver to you, what am I doing? H A V E R. Yell at me. No. I have no idea. <laughs> Vomit. <laughs> so that's, that's that if I was talking haver. nonsense to you. Oh. Haver. Haver. Yeah. yeah. Haver. Oh, okay. All right, we got that. Like, yeah. right, oh. Write that one down. Write that one down. Right. <laughs> so. If you're walking down the street and a girl was walking towards you and she was to give you the book, what is she doing? Giving you the eye. 
Police. Give so me the book. The book, so B O K E. Uh, okay. Yeah, it, it, it's it's uh, the come to bed eyes, yeah? <laughs> well, let's say that. <laughs> that. So, what it means is she's making you feel sick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the complete opposite. <laughs> My mistake. So, across, I don't know if you've got it the same over there, but across here you've got a lot of uh, vans that uh, they'll, they'll show up at football matches and things and, and they'll serve you food out the van. Yep. And a lot of them will they'll serve you breakfast, different breakfast uh, items. So if you were at a breakfast van... And you asked for a double decker with a square and tatty. What would you receive? Oh, I'm going to have a guess. Is it pancakes? No. <laughs> ah, come on. Uh, go on, Jane. It's your turn to embarrass yourself. <laughs> Is it like a burger or something? Uh, kind of. Like a, like a, a breakfast sandwich? Yeah, so it'd be like a roll, and it, it, the square, the double decker is because there's two items on it. That's correct, yeah. The square yep. would be square sausage. Mm -hmm. You get two different, you get linked sausage, which is long, and you get square sausage, you get square sausage, and you get tatty, which is tatty scone, which is made out of potato. Oh, tatty. Never had that. That sounds, yeah. that sounds yeah, interesting. Yeah, it does, yeah. I wonder if he knows what an HSP is. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> off we go, your turn. <laughs> so, imagine it's Christmas morning, you get some new aftershave in your stocking, and it's described as boggin, B-O-G-G-I-N. What does that mean? We've got bogans over here, but it's a different bogan, isn't it, Jay? Yeah. <laughs> do you know what a do you, do you know what a bo, do you know what a bogan is in Australia, Ian? It's like no. a Geordie. No. <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> um, uh, bogan. Um, I don't know, Jay. What do you think it is? Oh, I uh, say that again. So if you if you received if you received some aftershave and it was described as bogan, bogan. What would what would that? It mean? means that it's that it doesn't smell good. It smells crap. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> 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 See, it's the opposite. What I was going to say. <laughs> so, here's a question for you. If you sat down in a um, if you sat down in a restaurant or a cafe, and uh, your friend had said, "Right, John G, what are you wanting to drink?" And you said, "Get me a juice." What would that actually mean? A beer. No. Nah. Oh, God, I'm not doing very well with this, Jay. Uh, give me a beer. It would be like, give me orange juice. Give me a juice. See, this is a trick question because in Scotland, anything that's not alcoholic is just described as juice. So you, <laughs> okay. So non alcoholic. So you do have orange juice, you know, you're, like you were saying, but, you know, you're... Coca-Cola, like your fizzy drinks, all that sort of thing. If everything's just referred to as juice, so you would need, <laughs> you would need to specifically say, "I would like a Coca-Cola or you know whatever it was." So if you ask for juice, you could get anything that's not alcoholic. <laughs> right? If you guys were playing, a, if you guys were playing a gig, you're playing a concert, and before you stepped on stage, I was there, and I said to you. Get loudy. What would I? What would I mean? Get welded. <laughs> no. Get rowdy. It means like rowdy. Get the rowd everyone up. Yeah, hype like, it up. like like make like a good hype it and hype it up. Just go out and smash it. Just like yeah. Just go for it, right? And. Uh, after the gig, when you walk off stage, if I was to ask you if, you if you're scunnered, what does that mean? Are you naked? Yeah, there you go, John. Yeah. I got one right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one, oh. I already asked Jay, but you might give me a different answer this time. 
Mount Rushmore for each of you. Who's the four bands or musicians for yourself, whether it be songwriting, whether it be performance, whether it just be the overall package? Who are the four bands for each of you that, that you just think is perfection for yourself? It would be Pretender by the Foo Fighters as a song. That was a great song. And the, the package to me was Velvet Revolver. Once That was a great band. Oh, yeah. That was a kick-ass band. Mm, absolutely. It blows um, my mind, blows my mind, Jay, that, that they have got a, another album written with no singer. Yeah. I'd I love know. it. It would be interesting because they were auditioning for a lot of singers at the time when Scott, even when he was alive, because yeah. he kind of, I think, I don't know what happened, but he kind of went to ground. Well, it, it was actually at, at the gig they played in Glasgow that he announced on stage, unknown to the rest of the guys, that this would be his last gig. Wow. But I think he was probably a bit messed up at the time. Yeah, definitely, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Johnny, I'm still, I'm still waiting on your answers. Yeah, yeah, I can see. I'm thinking. Uh, it's hard when you've got so many things that are, are so special in your life. I reckon one of the greatest unsung heroes uh, bands that, that should have been massive were the Lars for me. Uh, yeah, do you remember the Lars from Liverpool? You know, um, perfect song, perfect album. Um, and, and they were really the complete lineup to me. I reckon they were fabulous, even though they were Liverpool. A bit like the Beatles, of course, but um, to me, yeah, yeah, super special. It's I still listen to that record. It's funny you mention that because uh, I've got a couple of bands on the go and one of them, the, the main influence is The Laz. Is Cast. that right? Yeah, so, we, so we've kind of, a few of the songs we've released, that's been the, that's who it sounds like, you know, like that kind of style. And it's a band that you're in? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. you have to tell me who it is later. I'll be curious to check that out. Is that on Spotify or whatever and... Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, say, I'll send you some links in that. Yeah. Uh, words yeah. In that. But, oh, uh, brilliant. Guys, it's been really good speaking to you. And, uh, Jay, it's been good seeing you again. Absolutely, mate. It's been a pleasure. But I, I do look forward. I'm looking forward to, to what you guys have got coming out, your new songs, music videos. Hopefully there's an album down the line. Um, if you're ever lucky enough to obviously bring the band over to Scotland, you give me a shout and I'll be there to, to tell you to give it loudly as you're walking on stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like to say that. Absolutely. A pleasure speaking to you. I, I wish you all the luck in the future. And uh, until then, good luck, guys. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you Lovely so to meet you. Thanks for having us Thank and you. thanks for supporting the band, mate. Yeah. Wonderful. All the best, mate. Thanks a lot. Thank all right, you. see ya. See ya.